Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum dear viewers and welcome to Her Thoughts here on Imam Hussain TV where today we're discussing the very important topic of how young mothers can cope with disabilities in their children. My name is Sayyida Mahdi and I'm honored to be joined by my esteemed guest sister Ruhana, sister Zahra and sister Salma. Sisters, assalamu alaikum and welcome. Walaikum assalam. Sisters, thank you for joining me as we continue our discussion of Her Thoughts, our Ramadan special. Inshallah, your Ramadan and your fasting is going well. Now, this topic of how young mothers can cope with disabilities in their children is important to discuss. We as a community, as a generation, are becoming more aware. We are becoming more educated. We are becoming more inclusive to disabilities within our communities. But perhaps we don't look at it from the point of view of a mother, how a young mother or how a new parent would feel if they were to realize that their child had a disability, or was diagnosed with a disability. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran in Surah Baqarah, Surah number two, verse 153 has said, Allah is with those who patiently perceive. Now in my limited knowledge, when I was doing my research for today's episode, I came across a, a statistic which was quite alarming. So UNICEF have estimated that about 15% of the world's population, that's more than 1 billion people, have some form of disability, be it congenital or acquired. Out of that, that's approximately 240 million children. Now this is those who are registered. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which was set up in 2006, made governments globally set out concrete plans so that they could lay out how they would provide inclusivity to disabilities within their countries. However, UNICEF have still estimated that there are still governments and there are still countries who need to do more in terms of physical accessibility, communication accessibility and also behavioural attitudes. Now, according to the UK, when they classify a disability, it's either a physical or a mental impairment that causes a long-term sustained difficulty in carrying out the day-to-day -day tasks that a person has or, or a person wants to carry out. And according to the UK, they classify it into six different categories. And we'll just go over this very briefly before we start our episode today. So according to the UK, they have said, First one is mental health. Now this is again a range of conditions, but some examples, for example, bipolar or schizophrenia. We have learning disabilities, which according to the UK uh, legalities and rules, they have said that it's a reduced intellectual ability to carry out your day-to-day -day tasks. You have speech impairment, you have hearing disability, you have sight disability, you have physical impairment as well. Now this could be, for example, your upper or your lower body and disfigurement. Now we've briefly given an overview of the different types of disabilities. Sister Rahana, I'm gonna to come to you first. And I also want you, if you feel comfortable to talk about uh, your challenges, what you've been through in your life as well. But let's, for, our viewers at home, let's open up today's topic of conversation and have a look at what are the different types of disabilities that we have. We've said that not all disabilities are physical. Some disabilities are not even perceived. So what are those different types of disabilities that we have? And then if you feel comfortable, please feel free to share upon the, the challenges that you've been through in your life as well. So Jazakallah Khair for having us on the show and um, I think it's such an important topic that we actually discuss because some of these become quite taboo topics within our communities and they're not really talked about. Um, physical disabilities are very obvious to be seen when we look around and we can tell um, they're not able to do something as the norm may do it. We may question what is the norm but the way society expects something to be done may not be done in that way but so many other things can come up. People are suffering with ADHD, um, especially after COVID in the times, people have gone through a lot of mental stress, a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, a lot of panic attacks. 
and little little things can start triggering these things and we may not look at them as disabilities and people may not even realize it's a form of a disability because you think this is just what's happened i just need to carry on but it's so important to actually look within yourself that where has this change come from what is triggering me be it things like kids in school with dyslexia you know they're too scared to own up that i'm struggling with homework i'm struggling to read um, teachers would pick on them to be like why are they not catching up with the class. Um, so many of these disabilities are not seen, as you mentioned. Um, we've seen people with Tourette's, there's someone in our community that in the middle of the program, you'll see them just shouting or saying something that's out of their control. And you know, you'll see the older generation telling them to be quiet, thinking that they just wanna be a disruption. But it's about understanding that some of these disabilities are not always seen and trying to understand what's going on with them. And again, you talked about things like mental, you talked about sight impairment, um, hearing impairment, uh, things like autism. Again, someone may look completely normal from the outside, but what they may be going through inside, uh, even through medical diagnosis, is very difficult to tell. So I think as a community, alhamdulillah, we are progressing, but I think that judgmentalness sometimes still you know, plays plays a part. And when you look at the um, the actual models and the frameworks that have come through therapists, when we look at the disabilities right now, they split it into two separate sections, one mm. being the medical model, mm. where the actual impairment is there. So for example, if someone is paralyzed from hip downwards, they cannot walk. It's a of obvious impairment that, you know, it's called the medical model. But there's a second one where they look at called the social model, where that person may be okay to sit on a wheelchair and carry on the rest of their life. But we as society may not be allowing of that. We may not have ramps in the places we need it, or we may not be catering for their needs. So that makes them disabled from what, not what they had, but actually because of society putting that pressure on them. So I think it actually disables the person more when we as a community aren't there to give them that opportunity to live uh, the way they needed to. So um, I think a lot of things aren't obvious. A lot of things cannot be seen. Um, and you did ask me to share uh, my experience, so just in a brief couple of minutes. Um, at the age of nine, um, I had gone spending a normal day at the park. Um, coming back, I was in a lot of pain and I got rushed into hospital and um, everyone was a bit stressed out of what was going on because there was nothing wrong at that time. Um, going to the hospitals and getting some x-rays done, they found out I had a curvature of the spine, a scoliosis, which just came out of nowhere. Um, and getting more and more tests done at the hospital, they found out it was a problem, it was an issue, it was a disease that affected every single bone in the body. And it was something that was never going to get cured, but it was just going to get worse as a person ages. Now, getting told you have a condition like that when there was nothing wrong before the age of nine is a struggle because at the age of 10, when your height is supposed to shoot up, mine went the opposite way and it stunted. Now, trying to be in school, and we've all been to high school, we all know what kids can be like, they can be quite harsh. At that time, all you wanna do is fit in. And when you're kind of pushed to be the odd one out every time, it's very difficult. Mm. And even though it's not an obvious disability, when people look at you, they think, what's, what's wrong? Why is there something different about this person? Mm. And you know, it's, it's difficult, it takes a toll on the mind, it takes a, a toll Absolutely. on your self-confidence as a person. Mm. Um, you know, you make friends during playtime and during sports, and when you're not allowed to do any of that because of your health conditions, you end up losing friends, you end up being kind of the odd one out. You mm. know, you end up standing out for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. And I think it becomes very difficult at the age of 10, 11, 12, kind of being in that time at school when you're really trying to fit in. And um, there was a quote that I read, you know, that really pushed me to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, has my back and he will not give me more than what I can burden. Um, an eye of the Quran has come, we will not burden a soul more than they can handle. Mm. And a quote that I read that those who know me will know I live it like a mantra. And it says, don't try and fit in when you're born to stand out. Mm. And I read that and I heard that and I thought, wow, I think this is for me. And I realized that, you know, there is no imperfection in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. It was me that was seeing the imperfection and not accepting the way he had created me because I was just looking at the norm or what society classed as norm. So when I started accepting me for the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created me, suddenly doors start opening, avenues start opening. Um, you see doors that you've never seen before. You know, there seems to be some light at the end of the tunnel. So everyone will go through their own struggles and, you know, in different ways, be it mental, social, physical and whatever. But I think when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts you in that situation, it's a big test of your faith to see, you know, where do I waver in my 
path of tawakkul. Mm-hmm. It's very easy to say, I believe when everything's hunky-dory. But when you're tested with a, you know, a health issue or a financial issue, or again, with children with disabilities, it's very, very tough to try and stay on that path. But alhamdulillah, it's a test for us all. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. You know, well. Yeah, you know, mashallah, Rahana. You know, I, I've known you for many years. Um, I'm blessed to call you my sister. We've been on ziyarats together. And I do remember when we were very young and we were going for a ziyarah. And this was during the early times when you had just been, perhaps, you know, you had just been told by the doctors or this was in the early stage of your journey. And um, I remember your marhum father, who we all miss dearly in the community. But I remember, you know, because I remember your journey from the early days. And, and I see you now sitting in front of me with all of us and subhanAllah you've come so far and what you said is true you you're perfect this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended and that goes with any disability or any trial that we face in our lives this is what Allah has ordained and as mothers we always go through something in our lives be it with ourselves our families and our children and and, a dis- and the test that you face with your children is i would say probably one of the hardest tests that you can face and i remember your mom um when we were younger you know we were so young but i still remember i still have that memory of us going for ziara and i remember speaking to your mom your father was there and those things stay with you forever and subhanallah now we're sitting across each other discussing it on mm. on on an episode and it just shows that how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened up doors and avenues for Definitely. you. Thank you so much Rahana for Thank sharing you. that story. Thank and and you, you say that and it brings to mind a beautiful um, Quranic ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Tawbah in Surah 9 ayah 51 where he said nothing shall ever happen to us except what Allah has ordained. He is our Lord and in Allah we put our belief and our trust. And this is exactly what you are saying. We put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, sometimes we have all this Quranic ayat, we have the narrations, we have the hadith from our beloved Ahlul Bayt but we are humans. We are not ma'asum. And we, we, we need to say Alhamdulillah in the tests and the trials that we face. We've, we've spoken about disabilities, you've given us your, um, your story as well. If a mother, for example, was to find out that her child, say during when the mother goes through scans, and she was to find out that her child was going to be born with a possible disability, or even after the, the baby's born and you realize that my baby has a disability, how would a mother cope how would she hold on to her strength and how how would she feel? Um, Sister Salma, I know that you, we were speaking about this um, earlier. So if you're open to it, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Sure, thank you. Um, so when I was pregnant with my second son, um, during the 20 week scan, we found out that there were some um, disabil- uh, problems with his heart and his kidney. I went for continuous scans and in that I met many different specialists and one of the specialists sat me down and said, your son has heart problems, kidney problems, that's an outlier for Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. So they kept pushing us to go for an amniocentesis where they can can make this confirmed diagnosis Mm -hmm. and then they said the reason we do this is because then we give you the option of removal of your child. Um, <clears throat> my husband and I we would never have done that. We, we knew whatever Allah gives us, that is a test for us, that is our child. We will deal with whatever we get. Um, in the beginning, when we found out there were all these issues, there was we were shocked. Mm-hmm. You never expect going into a pregnancy, you're going to find out that your child has all these problems, is going to need surgery straight from birth. There was, there was sadness, there was shock. It, it, took a, it took some time to sink in. Mm-hmm. But then there was that sense of hope that the baby's not here yet. We still had 20 weeks to get through. There were constant scans with a cardiologist and a nephrologist to look at his kidneys. And we had the power of prayer. We, we told our families, both our families knew that this was coming, that a child would be born that would need surgeries, potentially could be a Down syndrome child. And we spent those 20 weeks praying, praying for the best outcome. Mm-hmm. 
And Alhamdulillah, we were very, very fortunate. He was he was born with heart um, uh, malformations. He required a couple of heart surgeries. He required kidney treatment. But Alhamdulillah, he wasn't born with Down syndrome. So it was, you just don't know what Allah's plan is. And we can't make that judgment call at that stage in that pregnancy. We have to accept what he gives us and just always pray for the best outcome. And he knows what you can handle. And he gave us, he gave us, there, there's always a hope. And I think with mothers who come across this diagnosis in pregnancy, mm -hmm. there's always hope. But even if the child is born, whichever way it is born, there's always him guiding you each step of the way. Absolutely. And like you said very truly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will only test us with what we can handle. And even with any hardship, there's always ease. Mm -hmm. He says that in the Holy Quran, that with hardship comes ease. And actually, I have that. Because I love this Quranic ayat, I have this actually in my home, right in the hallway where everyone can see. Because no matter what trial or what test you're going through, and if the day is not for you today and you've had a hard day, you look at that Quranic ayat and you realize that Allah will only test you to what your soul can take. He will never go more than that. And whatever test you have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever hardship you have, whatever blessing you have is from Him alone. And it's a way of us gaining closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's, it's platforms like this, it's topics like this today where in this holy month of Ramadan, we can learn and grow closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Ahlul Bayt alayhum as -salam. So Sister Zahra, I'm going to come to you next. Your brother, now we were speaking about Down syndrome. Your brother has been diagnosed with Down syndrome, if I'm not mistaken. How... How was that for your parents? How was that as a family unit? What adaptations have you had to do? What kind of learning and growing have had have you had to do? And and also, were your parents aware of this when, say, when your mum was in birth during pregnancy? Was she aware of this? Was it something that was diagnosed later on when he was born? How have the family dynamics and how have you as a family come together and grown closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala? with this blessing definitely yeah um firstly I, I would like to say that the topic of disability is definitely a topic that we should ha talk about more within the community i think only in recent years that the topic of disability has really come to to a light in our community um it's a topic that i'm very very passionate about i've always advocated for disability having a brother that was born with down syndrome um and even one who went while he was younger when he went to a special school i volunteered there. I worked with children with Down syndrome, children with autism, children with ADHD. And I always felt like this was like a secret community that our community didn't know about mm -hmm. because I would go into mosques and I, would, well, I wouldn't see anyone with Down syndrome or autism or ADHD. And I think many people de didn't even know about these diagnoses. Um, and I always wished that that would, that, that would ha be a topic spoken about. So Alhamdulillah, now more people are aware of these diagnoses and these disabilities. Um, because as the first question that you said that, you know, um, many people associate disability with either physical disability. And I would say also they would associate it with profound intellectual disability. Those are two aspects that people associate disability with. But we know that there's a terminology that's used that's of hidden disabilities. There are so many disabilities that are hidden from, um, the uh, from our sight. But it's there. So I've also seen a child run and scream in a mosque and being told off. And then that mother come, came up to me and said, my son has autism. So him scream, screaming or flapping his hands or um, repeating a certain um, sound is him trying to regulate himself. So I think unless we're aware of those hidden disabilities, we will continue to punish children for something that is very natural. So coming to my, bro my brother, my brother was born with Down syndrome, um, which is when the chromosome 21 is duplicated. Um, it's by chance, nothing genetic, nothing. Even previously, they said it's, it's older women that have them now. The odds are many younger women are having children with disabilities with, with Down syndrome. He was born with Down syndrome. Um, she didn't know during pregnancy. Um, she had a scan, but I think the, um, how advanced the equipment were back then, they purposely didn't pick it up. But... When she gave birth, she knew it was it was different. Mm -hmm. um, by the facial features, she knew it was different. Um, and then they confirmed it while she was in hospital. So um, growing up, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know he had a disability. Um, it wasn't something I was aware of. Even people will say, well, they have very distinctive 
facial features how did you not know I honestly didn't know he was just one of us um I didn't know I knew there may be something there because there was more attention on him than let's say me and my other sister we're all born within one and a half year from each other so my brother and then I had another sister that's born um one and a half year um before him and then me I was born one and a half year before her so we're all very close in age we all used to play with each other I didn't know he was disabled I didn't know he had Down syndrome it was pretty normal um and he went to the same mainstream school as us but I remember people saying oh he's so cute he's got puppy dog eyes like people used to make those references like oh he's and I was like why is he getting I think that was the realization to me why is he getting more attention but I would say Down syndrome people can believe me or not has been the biggest blessing on our family um and I don't care if people don't believe me because that is the reality that it has been he has such a blessing especially after my father passed away he has been the glue that's kept us all together and he's like brings so much joy to our family so sometimes people fear what they don't do not understand people may fear that their child was going to be born with down syndrome or their child will be diagnosed with autism adhd or have a physical disability or have an intellectual disability but we fear the unknown and we fear what is that going to look like what is our future going to look like and it's not as scary as we believe Allah truly plans our life the best of ways. Like my mom now says, I thank Allah for giving me him because now my father's gone. She's with him at home. And if he wasn't there, I think she'll be alone majority of the time. So it's a big blessing. Allah truly, truly, truly understands our lives and he understands what is needed for us. So, um, yeah, so it's been a big blessing. Um, I, I honestly can't think of many negatives. I know you said what challenge. I can't think of many negatives. I'm sure he perhaps went through negatives. But I would say the the perception of the community. So I've heard comments, especially when you go to the Middle East, people say we'll mimic or try to make fun of of him. Um, and that is very clear that you see that, especially with children. It's a lack syndrome. of education. Lack of education. This is why we need more education. And programs like this will harbour knowledge and harbour understanding within the community so that we don't have these um, or even... Because, by the way, they are an amana for us. And I work with a charity called Amanity, which cater towards the disabled. But they are an amana. They are truly pure individuals. And when I say this, that when you look at someone with Down syndrome, the, the pen of accountability, Allah's pen of accountability has been lifted from these individuals. They're pure. So on the day of judgment, we're all standing there being accounted for. And, you know, we're waiting to go to heaven. These people are going to first intercede for their parents. And second, um, they are going to enter heaven while we're standing there. You know, we both use a reference of blessing and, and children are blessings on their own. But a child with a disability, the status that that child has in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but not just the child, the status that the parents have in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so profound. And their pathway to Jannah is a lot easier. There's a beautiful story by our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, where in a narration, a female came up to him and this is a female who was suffering from some form of epilepsy or seizures and every time she would have an epileptic fit and she would seize the of course we know it, there's different you know types and there's different the, the severity as well but her seizure was such that she would fall on the floor she would lose complete consciousness and then the way that she would fall sometimes her body would fall in a way where certain parts of her body would be shown so she goes to our beloved prophet and she says ya rasulullah you are the mercy to mankind you are the best of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creations please help me and please ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala please intercede for me and take this illness this disability away from me and our beloved prophet says to her i can do that i can pray for you and i can take this away but he just moves his arm and he shows her her status in Jannah. And he moves his arm and he shows her house in Jannah, where her status is. So he says, I can move or remove this, but this is what's awaiting for you. And sometimes we don't know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses a certain path for us for a reason. You have had to go through that with your son for a reason. You've had to go through your trial and your challenges for a reason. And myself as well, you know, nobody's life is easy. 
we all have challenges with our children and the challenges as a parent that we face with our children I say are the greatest of tests but they're also the greatest of blessings because that is that test and that blessing which will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now we've spoken about inclusivity within communities and we've just touched upon whether communities are doing enough alhamdulillah and, and actually we were speaking about this before the episode alhamdulillah now as a community as generations we are becoming more and more aware so for example we will have sign language being posted on our screens. And Rahana, you're heavily involved in the community. We will have sign language being posted on our screens. I myself, as a teacher in the madrasa there, have had to go through training to be able to, uh, in the limited capacity that I have, but we have children who come with, who have speech and hearing impairment. So I will have to go through Makaton training as well. My own mum herself, my mother, she has worked with speech impaired children for years and years. So Alhamdulillah, as a community, we are progressing and we are progressing in the right direction. Now, say if you go back 10 years, we had uh, one of the community ladies who had children who were born deaf. And she set up within the mosque, she was one of the first ones who would give sign language or Makaton training to volunteers and that's how it expanded so now we fast forward we have professionals we have disability services we have hearing impairment services although day-to-day -day activities with them are still restricted and there's more that we can do and Rahana you will you can elaborate on this but we are trying to slowly slowly move in the right direction so that we are more inclusive within the community now Rahana you work heavily within the community you're involved with different youths and different sectors are we in the community do we have a a network a support network where a parent or parents can get the help that they need should they feel that they should their child be diagnosed with a disability do we have enough in the community where you can get that support network in the community and also to help them to understand what there is in the external community as well because for a first-time parent it's a very unseen world they're entering new waters new territories and it can be quite overwhelming and quite daunting Rahana what what do we have in our communities so alhamdulillah as we said I think we're moving forward in the right direction you know these topics are being talked about a bit more than mm -hmm. before they're being addressed they're actually being acknowledged rather than kind of you know, pushed under the carpet because growing up in an Asian community, you're kind of told if you're different, put your differences away. You just need to be like everyone else and look like everyone else. But Alhamdulillah, I think we're opening our eyes now to see this is the beauty of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. If all of us were the same, it'd be a boring world. Just four of us sitting here have all got our own stories. We've all got our own journeys. And I think that's what makes us special. So I think the communities are taking this on board now. And I can only speak from our Hujjad community where I'm from. And Alhamdulillah, they've started the whole SEND movement now, which is the special education needs and disabilities uh, sector, heavily run by a few of our ladies. And Alhamdulillah, they've done such an amazing job by, again, bringing the sign language onto the screen, being one of them, the special emojis that are there to be able to make these uh, disability more awareness for them to be able to understand what's going on on the screen. Um, the special sensory room that just got launched a couple of weeks ago. It's beautiful for the kids. It's all about touching, seeing, the lights, the sounds. It's really nicely done. Again, allowing the kids to have somewhere where they can feel comfortable. And just recently they had a program where they had, if I'm not mistaken, it was a therapist or a psychologist that came in. And there were specially trained volunteers in the SEND section where they took the kids away and the parents could actually talk to the therapist, talk to the psychologist about what was going on and interact with like-minded parents who may have been struggling with the same things. And each of them said the feedback, you know, was that they appreciated that hour or two hours so much to be without their kids because they've never been that confident or that comfortable to know their kids will be looked after by the right people. They're not just chucked into a crash and expected to play. There's actually people there who are empathetic, who know how to look yes. after kids with special needs. And that hour or two helped those parents so much and gave them like a, a big hug that we're all from the same community mm. and we will understand where you're coming from. And I think things like this become so important because you realize you're not on this journey on your own. 
Yeah. Sometimes you get secluded in your household. Mm. You know, there's so many parents I've heard when they've had a disabled child, they don't want to leave the house because they're like the fear of acceptance, the fear of what the community is going to say about my child. And you know what our old, older generation used to say, you must have done something to get a child like this. Mm. You know, it's that fear, what's someone going to say? But I think now these things are slowly being brought in. And again, the more accessible stuff, like the obvious lifts and the ramps and things that make things more accessible. And I know being in the women's board and being part of the ladies, um, little, little changes are what makes a difference. There was a lady who came to the mosque last Muharram and she came to the door and she didn't know where the ladies was or where the gents was. And because of that embarrassment of not telling someone she couldn't see, she left. And she said, I don't want to come back. But that made us realize that having braille on the door would be something that was so important that a blind person who has a stick that can come in just needs to know where the gents is and something tiny yes. is that. But it opened our eyes but to what needs to be done. Sometimes it's those experiences that Definitely. we need. We are going in the right direction, yeah. alhamdulillah. But it's those small experiences. And this is something that I started off in my introduction, communicational barriers. Although, alhamdulillah, we are progressing, those communication barriers are still there. And like you said, braille, something so simple mm -hmm. for somebody who has a uh, sight impairment. And remember, sight impairment doesn't just have to be congenital. It can be acquired as well. Sight impairment can be partial or total. So there's different levels like hearing impairment, like speech impairment. It can be a, a partial amount. It can be a full amount. So there's various levels of a disability that a person can go through. And it's... Alhamdulillah, our communities, I can say, like you, you talked about the SEN community, the committee, even as madrasa teachers, we are, we are being educated in a way that we are being, and I don't say forced, we are, we are willingly open to learn a new technique of teaching because when you have a madrasa child, not, and you have 30 children that you are teaching in your class, the because we are becoming more more and more aware in our communities sometimes if you have that background training you can easily pick out as well mm -hmm. so sometimes like we said it's hidden and it's not obvious to see and when you start teaching a child who may have for example maybe on the lower end of autism maybe on the lower spectrum end of autism it's sometimes it's masked you don't have those obvious clues there and when you have that background training and when you teach them slowly you can realize that this child needs help and that's when we have the teachers in there and the professionals who can then take them to one side and work with the parents engage the parents to give them the coaching and and the help that they need now we are coming towards the end of our topic i just want to in the last couple of minutes touch upon are we as a community have our attitudes changed are we realizing that there are disabilities are we consciously changing our behavior to allow those who have disabilities to feel that they are included within our communities. What can we say about these sisters? Community mindsets have definitely changed. Mm. I still feel though that we're stuck in more of a reactive instead of a proactive mindset. Yeah. The changes are being made but we need to think ahead for future generations to come. You need to think, like we said about the Braille, we need to have Braille Qurans in our mosques. We don't have them. Yeah. We need to think of children who are dyslexic, who can't read left to right. There's all these things, but take it out of the community setting and now say we're going for Ziara. When you go for Ziara, there's no sign language. There's no Braille. There's a, lot, a lack of help in these places as well. So I think we are moving in the right direction. Mindsets have changed. Disabilities are no longer seen as a taboo thing. Mm. People are becoming educated, people are learning, people are engaging, people are exploring all these things and working together. But now we need to start working forward and be more forward thinking, be more proactive, mm. see what we can do to set the, the stage for the future. Absolutely, it's all about education. At the end of the day, we need to learn in order to grow as an individual and as a community as well. And alhamdulillah, it's platforms like this that we can engage, we can learn. And when, when I speak, I speak for myself first. It's a learning curve for me. It's a way for me to learn first. And inshallah, our viewers have found this episode beneficial as well. Thank you so much, sisters, for joining me. And inshallah, the rest of your Ramadan is blessed. And inshallah, we use this month to grow, to learn, to adapt, to become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Ahlul Bayt alayhum as inshallah. Thank you, dear viewers at home, for joining us as well. Inshallah, we pray that this month is a month full of abundant blessings for you, 
your family and your children. We pray for the shifa of all the marid around the world. And we pray for the eternal safety and quick reappearance of our beloved Imam Zamana. Alayhi salam. Until next time, dear viewers, thank you for watching. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.